Thank you, Nova. And Vi, you know, I too have heard many of your stories. And I know that they always took us outdoors. She is the nature queen. And even her son carries that tradition on, if you've seen him on Facebook with his birds. A long time ago, Dick and I, Dick is my husband, and our daughter happened to come with us, and we decided we were going to go to Spain. And we had these two um, tickets from the uh, airlines, what do you call those, that frequent flyer mileages. And so it was perfect for us to use it to go visit Spain, because that's where Dick's family came from. His, his father. His father lived in the northern part of Spain. He had since died, and so we went to be with his father's brothers and aunts and uncles. We really wanted to meet them. And, um, you know, Dick's my husband, and I'm attached to his family, and I loved his father. And it was so interesting when um, we first met his uncle reminded me so much of Dick's father. And um, we, we visited, Santander is in the northern part of Spain, if you've ever been there. Anybody been there? You know, I knew uh, Luis and his family are new here, and you've been to a lot of places, right? So Santander is a beautiful place. It's right on the coast. It's the northern coast. And uh, fishing is a big part of it, and farming. And anyway, we stayed with Dick's uncle, and he was retired living in the house where they grew up. And his daughter did all the cooking and everything, and he was basically retired. I just remember him at the end of the day with his bowl of fresh milk. And we were thankful because they didn't drink a lot of wine, because that's traditional in Spain. You don't get water, you don't get wine served, you get water. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying. The bottle of wine is put right in the center of the table when you go into a restaurant. Anyway, we stayed in that house, we got to go see the house that Dick's father was born in, it was kind of in ruins. And over in Spain, they never tear a house down. I don't know why it was in ruins. It was kind of, it's stone, and it kind of came down the wall, um, you know, at an angle. And um, we were able to go see where his dad was born. And it was neat. And they took us around the family, were gracious and wonderful, and cooked good meals. Every day, fresh fish would come to the house, and we were thankful because we thought they ate a lot of pork in, in Spain, and that was going to be a problem. We had fresh fish, and the best, Dick would tell you, the best bread, that skinny little loaf, he says, is the best bread I've ever had. And they cooked traditional Spanish food, not tacos and burritos and beans and rice. It's completely different. A tortilla over there is a potato egg dish in a frying pan, thick, very good. Um, our daughter came with us, and then she left after the first week, and then we went south. We left the family. They took us around and showed us so many neat things. And so we traveled to Madrid, and then down to uh, Seville and uh, Toledo and Granada, all those really neat places. I had done a lot of reading up, and so I knew where we wanted to go before we came, you know, before we went on the trip. And so um, we uh, ended up in Barcelona. Now, if you've ever been to Barcelona, that's a neat place. I don't know, there's just something about it. Everybody needs to go to Barcelona. And there was one thing that was kind of neat in Barcelona that I noticed. Do you know what Pundonor is? Pundonor. It means with honor. 
And the people in Barcelona, during their um, siesta time, every afternoon, everything shut down. I mean, everything. You couldn't find anything to eat, whatever. And so the people would be out in the center of the town, cobblestone streets, and they would be walking arm in arm, dressed up, this is during the, the week, dressed up in their Sunday go-to-meet and clothes. Pundoner means, I am I'm okay, I, I may be poor, I may be rich, it doesn't matter. It's a sense of pride. And that's what God gives us, isn't it? We can all hold our heads high. And we saw it up in the northern part. I want to show you if I can uh, get this working. Okay, this picture is in our house. This reminded me so much of what it was like in the northern part of Spain. Um, it's, you know, the dichotomy. We're driving away in a car, and Dick's cousin is coming towards us with seated on top of a load of grass that he had cut for the cows and the horse pulling it. Very traditional. But in the morning, he went to work in an office dressed in a suit and tie. But he's just as proud sitting on his pile of grass. And what's interesting, in Spain, you don't see any cows, but they're everywhere. You'll be driving along, and I remember asking the family, are there cows here? Yes. Where are the cows? They're in the garage. That seems strange, doesn't it? That's where they kept the, the, the cows, in the garage. And I asked them if they ever let them out, and they said, no, they stay in there the whole time. Veal. They eat veal instead of the beef that we're used to. And inside there would be a milk cow, which uncle drank that fresh milk. And there would be one raised for their own consumption and one uh, to, to keep having babies. And they always had five or six. And in Spain, it was interesting because um, if you had five cows, no, if you had 10 cows, you were rich. Most people had about five. And I told them my mother had 20, and they thought, wow, she must be rich. <laughs> uh, my mother wasn't rich, but she was rich, you know, pundonor. <laughs> and so um, it, it's interesting to see these cultures, and we had a really good time. Um, but as we got nearer our three weeks, we're kind of like, we've seen a lot. We just want to go home. And one of the hardest things was the language. All of you know how it is when you travel. Well, Carlos wouldn't have trouble over there. But if you didn't speak Spanish, there's this, it's a little bit different. but. The interesting thing was Dick and I had to stay close together because he was raised in a family where his mother and father would speak to him in Spanish and he would answer in English. I, on the other hand, had gone to high school to brush up. I mean, I had, I'd gone to college to brush up on my high school Spanish and I could speak, but I didn't understand. So you see, we stayed real close together. And if somebody asked a question, I'd say, what'd they say? And then in my mind, I would formulate what my response would be. It was hard. And I could just remember my brain just kind of tired of always having to think. And it's like, I just want to go home. And I notice that we have some special guests that came home Kevin and I, they came home to Tracy, clear from Japan. Do you like coming home? Is there any place like home? Okay. Um, 
we're going to be looking at Daniel. Now, here's Daniel. You can tell he's an old man. This happened when he was close to, well, okay, when he was taken into captivity, maybe he was 15 years old, and now it's about seven, almost 70 years, so that makes him 85 years old. And he's in the lions, and I see Kim over here smiling, because she would love to be there. So Kim, this one is for you. You can think that Daniel was in there having a good time with the lions and petting them, and they're just sitting there smiling at him. <laughs> so um, Daniel is in his room. You know, he's in the uh, employ of the king. He came as a Jewish exile around 680, and he worked his way up into the palace because he was honest, because he was bright, because he was wise, because he possessed the greatest integrity. And unheard of, except with Joseph, to have a, an exiled person to rise up like Daniel did. But that's what happened. You can read all this. Read the book. Read Daniel. Read some of the other uh, books a lot of history. I love it. So Daniel's reading, and he, uh, well, okay, let's wait on this one. All right, we get to look at the lions. Um, so Daniel's reading from the scriptures, which would be in a scroll, okay? And he was reading what was written for Jeremiah. Jeremiah's scribe wrote it. And he gets all excited because he's reading something that he's read it before 70 years and your people can go home. And he looks at the calendar and he's been marking it off and the 70 years is almost here. And he's thinking, wow, my people, you know, we get to go home. And He's brought back 70 years before when he lived in Jerusalem, in the palace, because he was a prince. He must have been one of the sons of the, the king. And he remembers seeing Jeremiah from time to time coming into the palace. And kings in those days had their resident wise people, just like today, you know, um, our presidents have their, their councils prophets and priests and wise men and they would come in and the priests and the prophets would tell the king what to do what to do but a lot of times they were telling them what they wanted the king to hear not what god wanted them to hear and god was speaking through jeremiah and jeremiah was a prophet of god and he spoke the truth and they didn't like what he said. Well, you know, he was a prophet of doom and gloom, a weeping prophet. It was a tough time. And so if you look at the history, Daniel's remembering he was beat. He was put in stocks. He was imprisoned. He was lowered down into a deep hole, which was called a cistern. Thank goodness it didn't have water, because the Bible says there was just mud there. And here is poor Jeremiah, because they didn't want to hear what the Lord had to say. Now, there was a time when Jeremiah was in a good palace. You remember Josiah? What do we know about Josiah? Is there any young person about eight years old? Who's eight years old here? Anybody? Okay. Anybody else? Eight-year-old, stand up. Well, all right, we got you. How would you like to be a king right now? Um. 
you wouldn't know what to do. But Josiah was wise enough to know who to talk to and who to listen to. And Jeremiah started out his prophesying at that time. And so Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. I think Josiah must have had a mother that was godly, and his father, no, but his mother must have taught him, and he saw in Jeremiah something special. Okay, now, what was Jeremiah saying to the king? He's giving God's word. The king might say, what is the, the, the Lord's word on this? And, of course, it's one way or the other. If you wanted to give him good news, you would. Okay, this is what Jeremiah said because God gave him the words. Obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Walk in obedience to all I command you that it may go well with you. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. They went backward and not forward. Now, this has to be pretty sad because who were the, these people? They were God's chosen people. And that's what you say about them. And it says they went backward and not forward. When the Israelites came into Canaan, God displaced the Canaanites because they were so bad. Now, they're even worse than those people. These are God's chosen people. That's pretty sad, isn't it? And Micah, who was a prophet before Jeremiah, he had said this. What shall I say about the homes of the wicked filled with treasures gained by cheating? What about the disgusting practice of measuring out grain with dishonest measures, who use dishonest scales and weights? The rich among you have become wealthy, your citizens, through extortion, boy, that's small, through extortion and violence. Your citizens are so used to lying that their tongues can no longer tell the truth. Therefore, I will wound you. I will bring you to ruin for all your sins. God gave his people ample time. Over and over and over again, the prophets would say these things to these people. God chose them. They didn't choose back. And that's sad. And so, what does God do? Well... You don't want me here? I'm going to step back. Okay? And so Jeremiah, he keeps going on. Among my people are the wicked who lie in wait like men who snare birds. This sounds... I can't believe believers acting like this. And, and like those who set traps to catch people, like cages full of birds, their houses are full of deceit, they've become rich and powerful and have grown fat and sleek. Their evil deeds have no limit and they do not seek justice. They do not promise, they do not promote the case of the fatherless, they do not defend the just cause of the poor. Well, you know, you can imagine Jeremiah telling the king this, he doesn't want to hear that kind of stuff, does he? You know, you guys are bad. And, um, and so, he goes on to say, I'm going to make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals. How important was Jerusalem to God's chosen people that didn't choose back? How important was Jerusalem? Very important. And Jeremiah says, I'm going to make you a heap of ruins. King didn't want to hear that. I will lay waste the towns of Judah, the other towns around, so no one can live there. I will scatter them among nations that neither they nor their ancestors have known, and I will pursue them with the sword until I've made an end of them. Doesn't sound good, does it? Not a lot of hope there. And so the kings would 
shut Jeremiah up and it's like, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I don't want that to happen. Now, we know what happened. Nebuchadnezzar came over and conquered Jerusalem and in many occasions came back and took a whole bunch of the people, took the cream of the crop, the smart ones, the good-looking young ones, took the artisans, the soldiers, all back to his country so that he could bolster his economy. We, we've read that. So here we are, and here's Daniel. And he's read that, oh, it's time. We're going to get to go home. Do you think Daniel longed to go home? Do you think the people that were exiled in the land longed to go home? Would you, if you were removed from your beloved Tracy <laughs> um, for 70 years, wouldn't you want to come back, at least check it out? <laughs> and here's Daniel, and what's the first thing that he does when he finds out something big is about to happen? The Bible says that Daniel three times a day would pray by his window. And what direction did the window face? East Jerusalem. West to Jerusalem. His beloved Jerusalem and the temple. The only sad thing is Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed all of it. But there was still that memory, that longing to be home. And what does he pray? I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Maybe that's the first thing we need to do when we pray. Confess. Lord, great and awesome God who keeps the covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. And... We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and princes and ancestors and to the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. I'm sure that Jerem, uh, Daniel thought, there's no way we can go back. God's not going to honor us with all that we've done. And he goes on, he says, Lord, listen, Lord, forgive, Lord, hear and act for your sake. My God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Come on, we want to go home. Now, Daniel was 85, maybe, years old. Do you think he would want to travel a thousand miles back to Jerusalem at that age? Or any of the other elderly Elderly. Was he elderly? No. Nah. George? Right. <laughs> and so um, Daniel didn't choose to go back, but his people did. And this is the interesting part. This is a really neat story. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, who's Gabriel? He's the head angel up there. I mean, this is reason to, whoa, <laughs> I'm afraid. Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight. So he's got wings. <clears throat> About the time of the evening sacrifice, he instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to you to give you insight and understanding. And this part, as soon as you began to pray, a word went out. What does that say to you? As soon as you pray, it goes up to God and God hears. That's pretty neat, isn't it? So, you know, people say, well, I've prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. Well, maybe there was a reason. Then he continued, Gabriel, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. 
and I have come in response to them. And here's the problem. 13 verse. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Okay, what was going on? Daniel is praying, and God is saying, okay, I'll answer your prayer, but there's some work to do. You know, sometimes our prayers don't get answered right away because there's work to do. And so here is the king. They say the prince, but they're talking about the king of Persia. He had to be convinced that he should let all these people go back home. Now, we, we remember what happened in Egypt. Pharaoh said yes, and then he changes his mind. But what is really neat is that the king of Persia agrees for all the people to go back that want to go back, thousands of them. And he says, I'm going to give you money, and I'm going to give you all the articles that were in the temple, the silver, the gold, thousands of them, and you can take them back, and I want you to restore the city, build up the walls, and rebuild the temple. That's, that's a pretty good answer to prayer, isn't it? The king, a foreign king, but what do you suppose influenced the king? You think Daniel had any part to do with that? I mean, look at his stint with the lions, that would tell you something, right? His God takes care of people. And so um, here he is answering the prayer. And so here's a picture of them going into captivity. And you notice the fires. That's what happened to Jerusalem. It was burned up. It was completely destroyed. The walls were knocked down. The palaces were destroyed. That magnificent temple of Solomon, the greatest structure in all the world, they had destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar did that. And here they are. Okay, go back one more. Here they are going home. Do they look like they're in a hurry? Let's get here. But do you know how long it took them? Five months to travel that journey. That was quite a return home. Okay, so reading again, and Nova read this before. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come for you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back. So God is now stepping in, and he's going to bring the people back, but he expects something of them. But he says, and, and this is really neat. you got to get this text in your head. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Isn't that awesome? That was written 70 years before, and Daniel's reading it. That is a wonderful promise. But when he does that, what happens to his people? Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Can't get much more than that. All your heart. You know, we struggle every day. I mean, I heard people say today they had a challenging week. How many of you had a challenging week? Things happen. Life is not always easy, even for kids. And God makes the promise that he will be for us. God chose each one of you here. God chooses us, right? But what's our response? We have to choose back. God gives us the privilege of making our own choices. If we don't choose back, God says, I'm sorry, I'm here, but, you know, as when they were in the um, wilderness, 
and the snakes were biting them. Why? Well, the snakes were always there, but God was protecting them when they called on him. Here, they weren't calling on God, and the snakes then did their damage. And he said, look to me. Look at the cross with the snake, and that's your answer. And then the snakes didn't bite. When we choose God, he chooses to be there for us. Through whatever garbage, whatever good things, whatever is happening, the promise is right there. I know the plans I have for you. And you young people, you have a lot of things ahead of you, right? You know, getting married, going to college, a career. Look at what it says. What does it say here? For I know the plans I have for you. Okay, God has plans for each one of us, even us old timers. We're still useful. And he has plans for us, plans for hope and a future.